Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast on navigating the new SEC uh, cybersecurity rules. My name is Bill Craig, Senior Solutions Director in the Cybersecurity Practice with GSI, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's webcast. We ask you to please take a moment to review our confidentiality notice. Okay, just getting by some of the administrative processes here for you. Now for a quick overview of today's meeting, it's gonna last about 60 minutes. First, we're gonna go over a couple of housekeeping items as well as provide you with a very brief company overview. Then I'm gonna take a minute, about 10 minutes to go over a summary of the new SEC uh, reporting requirements. Then I'm gonna turn it over to our main presenters and they're gonna discuss actionable steps you can take to prepare yourself for the new rules. And that's gonna last about 30 minutes. And then we're gonna wrap up with the 10 minute question and answer session. And as mentioned, we'll have a Q&A at the end of today's webcast. So if you would like to submit a question, you can do so using that Q&A icon, which you'll see there right in the middle of the Zoom menu. So now for the brief company overview as promised. So who is GSI? GSI was founded in 2004. We're a forward-thinking organization that helps companies align and optimize their digital footprint with their business goals. Our practice is based on four pillars, which you'll see over on the left there. Those include cybersecurity, cloud services, enterprise applications, and business process optimization. We have over 125 industry professionals, but we do have resources available worldwide, which allows us to offer a 24 by 7 global support model. And most importantly, we offer 100% guarantee on everything that we do. So let's talk about our cybersecurity practice very briefly. Um, our cybersecurity practice encompasses a comprehensive suite of solutions and services not designed to protect your business from cyber threats. I'm not going to read them off, but you can see our, all of our different solutions and services listed on the right there. Just give you a second to look at that. Okay, let's move into our main topic and explore the new SEC cybersecurity rules. So um, recently in a press release, uh, SEC Chair, Chair Gary uh, Gensler stated in the press release, I'm just going to read this exactly what he said. He said, currently, many public companies provide cybersecurity disclosure to investors. I think companies and investors alike, however, would benefit if the disclosure was made, and this is the really important port, point, in a more consistent, comparable, and decision useful way. And the new rules are meant to address these concerns. And even though the new rules didn't take effect until mid-December of 2023, about a week ago, or excuse me, a couple weeks ago, uh, many public companies have been preemptive. And we're going to look at some of the um, some of the most recent uh, AK filings by major corporations in late 2023. And we're going to start off with uh, Clorox. Clorox recently experienced a significant cyber attack that led to widespread disruption in their operations, and that included delays in uh, processing orders, uh, considerable product shortages, and here's the amazing thing: the company initially anticipated decline in net sales ranging between an astronomical $487 million to $593 million. However, as of November 7th, they updated the projection to a loss of only $356 million. So pretty significant. Um, MGM, you're probably familiar with this one, but in a, in a highly publicized incident, uh, data breach that they had there, MGM reported on October 7th, it expects they $100 million hit uh, to their quarterly results. And in a very recent event, uh, actually as, on December 18th, when the rules actually did take effect, uh, apparel maker VF Corporation with brands, you're probably familiar with North Face, Vans, uh, Timberline, Jan Sports, and others, they reported a major cyber incident disrupting operations and its ability to, to fill what is very similar to Clorox, as a matter of fact. Um, and they couldn't determine the financial impact as of yet, if any, but I'm sure they'll be updating their 8K filing shortly. Now, to show that the SEC means business, on October the 30th, 
the SEC disclosed that it had levied charges against SolarWinds Corporation, but more importantly, personally against the Chief Information Security Officer. And those uh, charges pertain to alleged fraud and failure uh, in internal controls over acknowledged cybersecurity risks and vulnerabilities. So major, major charges there. Again, not just against corporation, but against the individual. So CSUs are, are majorly at risk here and other executives. Um, and this was in connection with a cyber attack that commenced on September of 2019. So this goes way back, but the charges were very recent again in, on the very end of October. So let's dive into three key aspects of the new rule. First up, we're gonna take a look at how companies need to disclose material cybersecurity incidents on their 8K filings. And if you're a, a foreign private issuer, uh, it'd be on your 6K. And then next we're gonna explore the annual reports detailing how you have to include governance, board oversight, and management's role in cybersecurity in the 10K filings, and that'll be obviously 20K for the FBI's. Lastly, we'll discuss how these rules address third-party risk and its impact, not just on the public companies, but more importantly, on the third parties themselves. So let's make some sense of the material incident part of the rule. So in the new rules, which came into play on 12-18-23, uh, but if you're a smaller um, reporting company, you have an extra uh, six months to uh, follow the new rules. But what, first, let's look at what is material. Something is considered material if it's likely to have a, um, that a reasonable investor would think is important in deciding to invest. So essentially, companies now are required to report material cybersecurity incidents in their AK filings. And they'll need to disclose the nature, which you'll see listed here, the timing and the scope of the incident, along with the material impact on how it's affected their financial condition and operations. Now, here are some key points to remember. Uh, you must identify and understand any significant cybersecurity incidents without unreasonable delay. And once you know it's material, you have a four day window to report. So this has to all happen very fast and you have to be prepared in advance because it's not if a cybersecurity incident will happen, it's when it does, you have to be prepared. So uh, you have to figure this out swiftly and accurately. So registrants need to have an incident response plan and forensics and experts uh, ready to move quickly in the event of attack in order to attempt to quickly determine the information that's needed for that disclosure decision. So again, that's really important, you're prepared there. And unless there's substantial risk to national security, and that has to be defined by the Attorney General of the US, there's no exceptions. And uh, there's a bit of breathing room uh, with a limited safe harbor from liability, if you do report, uh, giving you some protection. Also, just another uh, small note in the rules, you have until 2018-24 to get all your reporting in XBRL format. And remember, if there's any updates, additions, or changes as more information becomes available regarding the incident, you need to amend your AK filing. So Ned, let's now talk about annual reporting obviously your 10K and your 20K if you're a, a foreign private issuer. Um, so starting from fiscal years ending 12, 15, 23, companies are now required to add some additional details to their 10K reports. Smaller reporting companies have an additional six months just like you did on the 8K. And here's what you'll need to include here. You're going to need to uh, include detailed descriptions of how you assess, identify, and manage any significant risk from cyber threats. You also need to identify the board committee in charge of oversight along with their processes for staying up to date. And lastly, a clear description of management's role in assessing and handling these risks. Same thing here. You have to um, remember to be XBRL compliant uh, 
within a year of when the rules kick in. So let's next talk about third party risk and its impact, not just on the public companies, but also on the third parties. And let's be clear, even if you're not a public company, it's not accurate to think you're off the hook with the new guidelines. So with the new rules, the SEC recognizes the interconnected world of the supply chain and the borders between organizations really begins to blur. So, you know, you think of software providers, cloud hosting providers, managed services providers, contractors, partners, suppliers, and vendors, they're all critical components to your supply chain. And the SEC recognizes it. And with the new rules, public companies have to have processes to oversee and identify material risk from cybersecurity threats associated with the use of any third party service providers. Requires issuers to consider incidents occurring both internally and within the third party provider. And then all and registrants are not exempt from disclosing cyber incidents in third party systems. So if they're if they're material and you have to know what's going on with those third parties, you need to report. And what does that mean practically? You want to thoroughly evaluate, kind of vet your providers and conduct risk assessments to determine how much risk these third parties uh, might bring to your operations. It's also critical to continuously monitor and reassess the cyber risk as they evolve for these third parties. And uh, it's just important third party because you're going to be you're going to be doing business with these publicly traded companies. So you're going to be held to the same standard. And it's not just the third. It's not just not the public companies that are going to hold you to that standard. It's the SEC as well. And the SEC's willingness to stretch regulatory parameters to private companies should be a warning to all companies and look no further than the actions they recently took against private companies, uh, Covington and Monolith Resources. Okay, enough of the overview. Now let's move into the main part of our presentation. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Brian and Dustin, and they're going to discuss uh, actionable steps you can take to prepare yourself for the new, these new rules. So first, let me introduce Brian Lisega. Brian is the CEO of Nitro Security, a cybersecurity services firm based on three pillars, including advisory and program development, assessments and compliance, and engineering and staff augmentation. Brian is a certified information privacy technologist, or CIPT, and a certified information uh, system security professional, or CISSP. And also really pleased to welcome Dustin Keenan. Dustin is a, a seasoned information security professional with over 10 years of experience. He started his career in the US Navy as an intelligence analyst. And after serving four years, he became a security engineer. And, engineer, excuse me. During his time as an engineer, he played a key role with various companies where he helped build information security programs from the ground up. Today, he works at Nitro Security as a senior consultant providing engineering and architecture services to clients across all industries. Uh, Brian, Dustin, you want to take it away? Yeah, we will do. Uh, first off, Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, we made it through uh, a crazy year. Uh, I saw a funny meme today where it was a, a guy at his computer saying, you know, 2023, and then it's New Year's Day, and he says this year is going to be totally different. And then you know, January 2nd, he's back at his computer doing the same thing. Uh, but anyways, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the first part in more detail uh, around material cybersecurity incident disclosure. I'm going to quote here and read from uh, the ruling. So quote, for domestic registrants, the disclosure must be filed on a Form 8K within four business days of determining that a cybersecurity incident is material. Okay, so we kind of got that. But let's focus on that last part. Within four days of determining that a cybersecurity incident is material. Uh, in general, uh, whenever you have a conversation, whenever you're having a debate uh, with somebody, you should always have agreement on what key terms mean, what are key definitions. So uh, this also applies to your organization. Remember that people uh, may come from many different industries, uh, they all have different backgrounds, maybe they uh, define terms differently there. So it's important that you and your organization start by uh, defining what is a cybersecurity event uh, and then followed by what is a cybersecurity incident. So I'll start with uh, what is an event. 
Uh, think of it simply as any observable occurrence within a system or network. Now, the kicker is uh, part two of the definition, which some orgs define uh, routine events, um, define the term as routine events, where other firms will consider abnormal occurrences as events. And with abnormal events, we typically uh, have those coincide with the security alert. So there's really no right or wrong answer here. Uh, but think of uh, these two examples. So a routine event could be an authentication login or authentication failure, whereas an abnormal event following the same uh, lens there would be 10 to maybe or 5 to 10 authentication failures. And what we often see is that 5 to 10 authentication failures followed by a successful login, which, you know, is probably an alert in your SIM uh, if you have that. If not, uh, it's a good rule to add. Lastly, uh, not all cybersecurity events lead to incidents, which I think is a good segue into our next topic. So with incident, uh, you can think of this as an event that results in some violation of a security policy or procedure. Uh, if you don't have very good or well-defined policies and procedures, another way to think of it as unauthorized access to systems and data. Now. If you do have a confirmed or even just a suspected incident, that should trigger your incident response team or CERT, as I like to call it. And therefore, right, that CERT team starts to carry out your incident response plan. Um, if you don't have a plan, now is the time to put one in place. Um, along that same vein, you know, an incident doesn't necessarily mean that it's a data breach, though all data breaches are incidents. So an example uh, of this scenario would be a DDoS attack where availability may be impacted for your company, but no data has actually been accessed or exfiltrated. And further, this is why the SEC uses that term, material cybersecurity incident, and not data breach. <clears throat> All right, so if you think about materiality right, in regards to that incident, um, Bill read a good definition uh, talking about materiality. So some sort of you know, substantial likelihood that a reasonable shareholder would consider it important in making investment decisions um, or the what they use is, quote, significantly alter the total mix of information available. You'd be thinking, well, what does total mix mean? SEC defines it as all relevant facts and circumstances, which may involve consideration of both quantitative and qualitative factors. Again, what the heck does that mean? So factors I like to use, I think these apply to all companies, though. Uh, it's going to be key that you take them and then also come up with the specific parameters that are going to be unique to your industry right, and really your company. Uh, so let's go through this list here. Uh, first one is the magnitude of the security incident. Um, think about the size and the scale, right? Is it happening to a few customers? Is it happening to all of your customers? Um, is it happening to one system, all of your systems, subset of systems, right? You need to define what those thresholds are. Maybe it's you know, one to 100 customers would be low, uh, 100, 200, medium, and anything beyond that is uh, high, right? So what you call material. Uh, factor two would be uh, nature of the information compromised. It's obviously, right, if it's public information they scrape from your website, that's less of a big deal. But if it's PII or EPHI, um, and if we think about uh, in terms of you know, how can it affect uh Maybe, you know, the, the prosperity of the company. What if it's the intellectual property that's stolen? How could that affect earnings? Maybe there's more competition that could then move into the space, start to take away your market share. Third factor is around impact to operations. We used that uh, DDoS example earlier. So uh, if your system is down for one hour, is that material? Uh, you know, if it processes, let's say, you know, 10 million bucks within an hour, maybe that is material to your business. Uh, Number four here is on duration, persistence, and remediation efforts. I kind of loop these all, lump them all together here because I think they're highly related. So think about duration of that incident. Um, if it's already remediated, you know, what were the costs uh, that went into it? Uh, did you have to put in new controls in place? Uh, how long was that attacker actually in the network? You know, was it was it ongoing for the last three months? Uh, did you catch him within, let's say, you know, a short time period, like an hour? Or is this ongoing and you're just really not sure uh, you know, when you're actually going to completely uh, contain the event or incident? Uh, number five is around financial implications. Uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, think about you know, the cost to remediate, uh, new fancy technologies you may have to buy. Could be a loss of revenue, uh, legal cost. Uh, next one was on legal and regulatory uh, consequences. Again, think about fines, lawsuits, 
uh, and class actions are becoming more popular too. Um, I think you know they, they tend to slow down a little bit depending on how much the um, regulatory bodies step in uh, and begin to legislate themselves. Uh, but the last one then is on reputational harm. Uh, again, it's hard to exactly quantify what that might be, uh, but it could be. Well, actually, I'll give you an example. So if you look at the target breach, what happened to them? You know, they have stores all over the place, all over the U.S. So it's common that you would be walking on the street. Maybe it's very convenient, right? You see a target. So it's always there and present you know, versus a, a business that's e-commerce only. It may be harder for them to bounce back from uh, an incident. So therefore, or a data breach, therefore, do they need to spend a lot more money you know, on marketing, et cetera, to you know, help restore their brand? All right, so those are the factors uh, I like to use. Again, come up, you have to come up with those specific uh, parameters for each factor, though, in order to make it you know, useful for your company. Remember, you only have four days uh, to actually come up with this. So one first part is determining materiality. And then uh, I have to say it, it's extremely critical that you engage your general counsel, whether that's uh, internal to your company or if it's external counsel, before you would ever publicly uh, declare an incident or a breach. I like to say that. You know, the term data breach is a big no-no at companies because you can get yourself into hot water um, if it's thrown around incorrectly. So you definitely want to engage with them. Uh, and this is all part of that plan you got to have in place so that, you know, you're not scrambling within uh, a couple of days here to put this all together. You know, and depending on your, the size of your company, it, it may be impossible to do this within four days without proper planning. All right. Uh, I that concludes the first section. Uh, Duster, anything to chime in there, Bill? Yeah, um, just there was a couple of questions that came in about a screen sharing. No, we're actually not screen sharing now. Brian is the screen right now. We, we have Brian's full attention. <laughs> but I just want to let you, every, everyone know that we're, we're not, we're not uh, doing slides for this portion. This is more of an open dialogue. I, I'm, I, Bill, I can send you the, uh, the factors um, that I just listed off, and you could post them in the chat. Okay. Can... Very good. Thanks, Brian. Sorry, go ahead. Keep going, Brian. Uh, no, I'm good. That uh, that's uh, my part. All right, thank you, Brian. Um, and just to piggyback off that, I I agree. I think one thing I recommend to at least all of our clients is um, build that internal team uh, that you can come together and discuss, you know, materiality and determine it together. Um, whether and do it for every incident, right? Is this material, is this not materiality? Um, I, I think it's extremely important that uh, you guys continue to practice that internally as well as uh, with any external counsels. Um, but kind of segueing into our next section, uh, we're gonna talk about risk management, strategy, and governance. Um, before we begin, uh, let's define some key terms at your organization. Um, so cybersecurity risk management, uh, this is the process of identifying, evaluating, and addressing addressing your organization's risk. Um, it's about under, understanding the potential risks to our systems, data, um, operations, and implementing measures to mitigate these risks. Uh, this process is continuous and involves regularly updating our security measures to respond to new and evolving threats. <clears throat> and I apologize, I'm just getting over uh, being sick, so if my voice goes out, um, don't hold it against me. <laughs> um, uh, next is strategy. So in the context of cybersecurity, um, we're referring to a comprehensive plan that outlines how an organization will protect its information and IT assets. Uh, this strategy aligns with the overall business objectives, uh, guides our decisions in cybersecurity investments and initiatives, um, and as always, a good strategy should be clear, actionable, and ad adaptable. Um, it must address, you know, your current needs as well as be flexible enough to evolve with the changing threat landscape. And finally, governance, um, which refers to the framework of policies, procedures, and practices that an organization uses to direct and control its cybersecurity efforts. Um, it's about ensuring that cybersecurity activities are aligned with business goals and conducted in a manner that is consistent, responsible, and actionable or accountable. Um, so with those terms being defined, let's first talk about um, how do we integrate cyber risk management into corporate governance? 
Um, so cyber risk is an integral part of our overall business risk. Um, it's essential that this understanding permeates our corporate governance. Uh, leadership must not only endorse, but actively engage in setting our cybersecurity strategy. Now, how can we achieve this? Uh, there's, a, there's a few different ways that we've uh, that we found to be successful. Um, one is sharing insights and findings from internal cybersecurity audits and risk assessments. Um, another is providing updates on the current threat landscapes and incidents affecting your industry. Um, but uh, as always, be cautious when doing that. Use clear, non-technical language um, and ensure your message is, you know, really being delivered. Um, I'll try uh, next. So what we always like to do is uh, what's called an information security advisory team or an ISAT. Uh, some people call this the information security committee. Uh, come up with your own name for it, but it's uh, basically a vehicle uh, that reports to maybe the CIO, you know, somebody in the executive team, uh, especially in, in most events, right? The, or most companies, the CISO doesn't necessarily sit uh, on the board, doesn't have a place on the executive team, but may report into the CEO or you know, maybe it's a legal counsel. And with that group, you know, that's where you can raise what are the risks, how we define risk management, what is our strategy around this, right? New regulations that are coming out, it helps ensure like nothing is, no big decision is being made in a vacuum and uh, major risks aren't being swept under the rug. But again, that's not a, a place for technical discussion. It's more for those high level items. That's a great point, Brian. Um, another thing you can do is, you know, conduct tabletop exercises that involve your executive team. Um, this will give them more insight into the challenges you're facing. And then, um, you know, the last recommendation is provide that cybersecurity awareness training uh, by addressing the personal aspect of cybersecurity. You know, uh, personal relevance can increase engagement and interest, um, and it'll be, it'll be more relatable for the executive team and uh, will draw interest into your organizational uh, cybersecurity. And before you do that, make sure you do the do the exercise with your internal team. Make sure you're all in sync so that when you do uh, engage some of those external uh, members or more senior levels outside your team, you don't embarrass yourself. <laughs> That's a great point. Um, which is leads us into our next section, which is continuous training and testing into in cybersecurity. Um, because the threat landscape is evolving, ongoing training and rigorous testing of our cybersecurity measures are essential uh, for maintaining a robust defense posture. Um, some, some things you wanna consider are conducting regular risk assessments, uh, identify vulnerabilities and evolving threats. Um, this will help you proactively, you know, fortify your defenses. Um, test your controls frameworks to ensure they're effective and resilient against uh, potential attacks. This involves not just checking their existence, but you want to make sure their functionality is serving its purpose, right? It, you know, is your, um, uh, excuse me, uh, that their functionality is, um, you know, serving its purpose under maybe a simulated attack scenario. Um, and then, uh, right? So I think too often people take these controls for granted, right? Are they okay? Oh, great, I got the firewall, or I have the AV. Yes, it's working fine. But we had uh, an incident uh, before with a client where won't name the uh, very popular AV vendor, but um, there was an uh, instance where the developer downloaded a Docker container uh, for a database. Uh, it came from we what we thought was a trusted source. However, something was. Something got in the middle uh, there and it was actually uh, infected with some type of ransomware that cleared out that local database, but it was all within that container itself. Uh, and the major uh, anti-malware provider did not see anything because it was on that hypervisor uh, level, which, uh, you know, they won't publicly come out and save. And we had to dig and dig and dig and say, you know, why, why wasn't there even any trace of that? And then they finally admitted, right? They couldn't see anything at the hypervisor level. Um. Yeah, that's that's a great uh, a great way to make sure you know make sure you test out your controls and you know they're working as expected or, or they're serving their purpose. Um, also, update your training programs and your incident response plans. You know, based on uh, 
based on your assessments and tests. You know, we'll we'll expand on this in the next session section, uh, but it's crucial that these remain current and uh, most importantly, actionable. Um, and then the last thing is creating a culture of continuous cybersecurity improvement. You know, make sure you're learning from each test after incidents, make sure you're doing a postmortem um, and you're adapting strategies accordingly uh, to, to stay ahead of your threats. Um, and our next section is building a robust uh, cyber resilience and response strategies. Um, you know, cyber, cyber resilience is about being prepared for and able to recover from cyber incidents swiftly and effectively. An incident response plan is not just a document. It's, it's your playbook in the event of a cyber attack. Uh, regular testing and updating of this plan are essential to ensure its effectiveness um, when you need it most. Um, to build resilience, you know, develop a comprehensive incident response plan, uh, which is regu regularly reviewed and updated. Uh, this plan should include clear roles, responsibilities, and procedures, um, and, and build a, a clear process around that plan. And, you know, in your incident response process, you know, whether you're building out playbooks and um, make sure you're constantly referencing your plan. Um, so that way it's, it becomes a living document. Yeah. It seems like um, it, way too often that people have a very generic incident response plan that they never use during an incident because it's almost useless, right? It has some contact information. That's awesome. Um, you can call the key people and, uh, maybe it has a couple, you know, additional formalities around it, but in terms of, you know, how do I, uh, let's say contain or eradicate, you know, a piece of malware on this server or on you know, maybe an, an endpoint in this environment here. And oftentimes it lacks that level of detail. Um, so I almost like to look at it, think of it as a, if you, you know, Confluence or whatever your internal wiki is, uh, rather than just create one document, you know, maybe it's a set of documents like a page tree. Uh, and in there, you can have those specific runbooks, which maybe you use those runbooks in as part of your security operations too, but um, you also want to be able to leverage them uh, during response. Yeah, I agree. And I, what we've done at other clients is, you know, we've built, helped them build templates that, um, you know, when, when they start an incident or they kick off the incident response process, right, it, it's referencing the plan. Um, it's, it's drawing directly from there. And, you know, we've used Confluence and, and Google Docs and, uh, and other uh, collaboration platforms, but you know those templates really help you make sure you're hitting everything in that plan. Um, and then you know after when you're doing that post mortem, you can go back and see, okay, maybe we do need to update our our incident response plan because this wasn't relevant there, or maybe we need need a new playbook for this specific um, scenario because you know we didn't have that built out. Well, and those, the risk assessment, right, which uh, I think you're going to talk more about a bit, Justin, but it, that's an opportunity, too, to test the limits of maybe where you may be falling short in terms of incident response, too. Um, and again, right, we, you have to be reporting on that strategy and governance. Um, that You don't need to list a specific risk, per se, um, which uh, we could talk more about in a bit, but um, internally, right, you need to be defining those. And again, you should be pushing the limits. It's not about just... You know, sweeping these under the rug and this, you know, putting on this facade. Hey, like everything's great. You know, with my with my program, you know, and you know, you keep the executives happy. Um, in the end, as you've seen uh, from Bill slides, you can get in serious trouble uh, by lying um, or not challenging yourselves to really uncover all the risk. Exactly. Um, the next thing is to conduct regular cyber resilience exercise, tabletop exercises. Um, test test out different scenarios. Um, but make sure you're involving all the relevant stakeholders. Um, you know, nothing's worse than when you get in a, an actual live incident, incident and you bring in a stakeholder and, you know, they have, they have no idea what's going on. Um, and, you know, panic is, is you want to limit panic during an incident. So the more training you do, the more preparation you do, the, the smoother those incidents will go and the more effective your response will be. Um, so tabletop exercises are extremely important. Um, and then invest in robust backup and recovery solutions. They're critical in ensuring uh, we can quickly restore operations um, in the event of an incident. And then 
foster strong communication channels within the organization. Um, so everyone's aware and prepared to act in case of a cybersecurity event. Again, this is, it's extremely important. Whether, you know, whether you're just responding to a phishing email or, or it's a full-blown incident, you know, make sure you're involving the relevant stakeholders, you know, get them involved in conversations. So every time a security incident comes up, it's not a full-blown panic. Um, they're familiar with the situation and they know uh, their role and how they can um, act. Well, Dustin, that hits on a key point. Uh, for one of the factors I mentioned was impact to operations. So depending on how good your recovery processes are, right, that, that can be the difference between materiality you know, of a event to a major incident versus if something that, yeah, right, it was serious and it was an incident, but we handled it so quickly that it had no impact on our operation. Or like maybe malware did get in the environment, but we were able to contain it faster. Maybe it was ransomware, but, you know, we contained it to one or just a few machines instead of the, you know, entire subnet or broader network. Exactly. So, yeah, build out those strong communication channels and you know, get everyone on board. Uh, it's it's it doesn't have to be a scary uh, a scary thing all the time. Um, our next section is going to be talking about shifting to a proactive stance on cyber threats um, for business and supply chain planning. And our approach to cybersecurity being proactive is key. This means integrating cybersecurity considerations into our business and supply chain from the get go. Um, we must leverage threat intelligence, predict, predictive analytics to anticipate and mitigate risks, uh, regular assessments of our cybersecurity practices, especially in our supply chain are crucial. Um, we can achieve this by integrating cybersecurity considerations into all business and, and supply chain planning. Uh, this means thinking about cybersecurity at every stage of our process. Um, so you know, when your teams are rolling out new products, make sure you're involved. Uh, in in that in those projects in that planning, uh, you know the the more involved you are at your organization, uh, you know just the smoother things are going to go. Um, make sure you're leveraging threat intelligence if you can and, and predictive analytics. Uh, this will help you anticipate and prepare for potential cyber threats, as well as um, make sure you're staying informed and on the latest cybersecurity trends and threats. You know this knowledge will enable you to adapt um, adapt your strategies and, and become more proactive. Right, your risk strategy has to account for somewhat of maybe the unknowns or what's happening in the industry. You know, if you just again, if you, you have your list of risks, maybe that you go through every year. If that list doesn't change, right, you're doing something wrong, and you're probably going to get owned uh, sooner or later. You have to be updating that list all the time. Um, I don't know how often you want to be doing these risk assessments. At least you got to be doing them once a year. Um, good idea to try and do it uh, at least once a year if you can. Exactly. And that's exactly what we're going to touch on next is developing a comprehensive cyber strategy and including your risk assessments and recovering. Um, having a comprehensive strategy is non-negotiable. It should encompass, you know, your risk assessment, threat mitigation, incident response, and recovery planning. Regular risk assessments help us identify and prioritize our security efforts. Um, they're vital to have a robust, um, um, excuse me, it's also vital to have a robust recovery strategy to minimize impact and, and ensure quick uh, restoration of services in the event of a breach. Um, ensure that your strategy covers all aspects of cybersecurity, and, and those risk assessments will help that. Um, you know, you'll you'll look at every aspect of of, of your program and, and identify any weaknesses. Um, involve stakeholders from across the organization. Again, this having that uh, having the business involved is going to be key. So um, it'll it'll help create a more holistic and effective um, approach uh, to building out your cyber strategy, and then. Um, Keep your strategy flexible and adaptable uh, to changing threats and business needs. Uh, this includes regular reviews and updates. Um, uh, anything else to add to that, Brian? I think uh, last part really think about how do we package uh, all this up together um, and, and do that reporting. Dustin talked about a ton, right? Which we, we need to be doing all of it. 
Um, but what's the right level of detail to actually include um, in the 10K finally? Um, I think you have to talk about methodology, right? You have to talk about these points at a high level, um, but don't be overly detailed if you don't have to. Uh, again, I'm not, I'm not your lawyer, so definitely talk to your general counsel, but uh, make sure that the point gets across that it's legally defensible. So uh, I always call it a little bit of a gray area and it's open to uh, interpretation, but you know, I also look at security as a competitive advantage. So you know, if I have two products, they're exactly the same, maybe they're competitors, they're both public companies, uh, who am I going to give my money to? Well, if they say the same thing, but one talks about security or maybe one provides more you know, detail about what they're doing in terms of security, I'm likely to choose that vendor over the one that you know, doesn't give me any information. Okay. Did we miss uh, anything? Um, I don't think so. Bill, did we cover everything? I think we did. Well, uh, Dustin, Brian, really appreciate it. Let me uh, share my screen here again, and uh, we will continue. <laughs> move to our QA. Hang on one second. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, Thanks again, Brian and Dustin. Uh, I'd like to cover a few follow-up items. Then we're going to move into our question and answer session. Uh, we ask, hang on one second, advance the slide here. We ask you, please take a moment to click on the link that and complete a quick survey before we get into the Q&A. Your feedback is most appreciated. And if you um, if if you do complete the survey, you'll be entered in a chance to win a $25 Amazon gift card. I do apologize for the link. I know that link is really long, but uh, that is the link to our survey. So if you could uh, complete that, we would really appreciate it. Um, if you'd like to learn more about how you know GSI and Nitro can help address any of your cybersecurity challenges, you can reach out via my contact information. I'll also chat that information out to you here now. Just give me one second and I'll get that out to you as well. Okay, let's keep on moving here. I did want to mention that GSI provides extensive free educational resources, including our weekly educational webcast, our monthly newsletter called the GSI Insider. Lots of great cybersecurity content out there on a YouTube channel. We do participate in all the major industry conferences and events, and we do have our online and virtual workshops. You can stay connected with GSI on any of our social media channels and Again, most important part, let's move into our question and answer. And I see we already have a, a few questions submitted online, but I would like to remind everyone, if you'd still like to submit a question, you can do so. You can see that Q&A icon in the middle of the Zoom window. You can submit your questions there. Okay, let's move into our Q&A. Our first question comes in from Jenna. And the question is, when is the 10K report due where we have to specify the risk management strategy and governance. I can take this one. So, Bill, I think you might have posted a link yeah, earlier. Yeah, I'll, I'll just put it up on the screen too, so everyone yeah. can see it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not believe, I don't pretend to be. Um, it. But Franklin Nellis did a really good job um, with this. So, uh, check this out. Um, it also depends on your company rate right? and when your uh, fiscal year ends, uh, what type of filer you are. So uh, it's not like everything is, okay, automatically due, right? Coming up uh, very shortly here. Some people have uh, much longer, you know, about halfway through the year so. Perfect. And I just uh, chatted out that link to everyone so you have that as well. Okay. Any other comments there, Brian? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Our next question comes in from Tyler, and the question is, do we need to list specific risk on the 10K report? Um, I would say no. Um, there is perhaps a carve out. Again, I think that it would be a little bit crazy to list you know, every single possible list. So it's more important to talk about you know, what's that strategy for risk management, yeah, particularly identifying uh, assessing or right, managing material risk. Um, now that, that carve out, um, I'm going to look it up here just to make sure I get it right. 
uh, and this is on the, I'm looking at directly at the SEC uh, ruling. So the exception would be any risk from cybersecurity threats, including as a result of previous cybersecurity incidents have materially affected uh, or are reasonably likely to materially affect them. So, uh, and this, I think, tags on to uh, what Dustin and I were saying earlier. So if there was you know, a specific risk that caused one of your previous incidents, you know, you can list that one out there. Or if there's something perhaps looming um, overhead uh, that you want to get in front of um, that may have an impact uh, in the future on your company, or maybe it's something that's happening in the industry, as a precaution, you can call it out uh, there as well in the report. But again, these are just one-offs. You definitely don't want to have your full list of risk. Um, the other thing I would add is your risk should be mapped to controls whenever possible. Uh, and again, I think that helps uh, bolster the uh, defensibility of your uh, risk management program. Hey, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Tyler. Okay, our next question comes in from Anonymous. As a non-public company that provides services to public companies, what are some of the things I can do to help my customers feel more secure? I mean, beyond filling out the 180 question forms. Uh, Dustin, you want to take this one? You want me to take it? Um, I can take a stab at it. I mean, I think the biggest, um, I think the biggest thing, right, is you know, if these if these are your clients, right, developing that partnership, um, and you know, doing those regular check ins to make sure you know they feel secure in the services you're providing, as well as you know what you're doing on the back end, um, and, and you know if you can, right, like if maybe maybe send out a, a scrub version of your instant response plan, show that you have a uh, robust process that's in place, and um, you know that that you are a trusted uh partner in this. To add on to that, um, I like to put together what's called security marketing material. So uh, this is a way to push back rather than having to fill out those uh, giant questionnaires. Uh, again, I'll go back to my example too, right? About let's say you have two, two competing products, everything looks the same, but one company talks about security, what they do on their website. And they're like, you think about a trust and safety page or something along those lines or a you know, trust center. Um, they'll have maybe their SOC 2 report in there, et cetera. Uh, maybe you can download some of their policies that are somewhat generic. Maybe your internal policies are more um, robust, but packaging all that together, whether it's on a web page or something that a customer signs or, or a prospect signs an NDA and you give that to them, you know, that all uh, helps to instill that confidence and and maybe uh, eliminates the need for that giant security questionnaire. Uh, one technique you can try is to say, here's you know all my materials that I've prepared for you. If you still have questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. You can do that over a live session or you've, you know, if something wasn't covered, right, let's jump on a call or maybe we can handle it over email. In some hey, cases, if it, this yeah, is ahead. John Bass, it's um, C. So I, when you're done, Brian, pass it my way. I'd like to, you know, we're in a similar situation. We're a small company. I'd like to toss my two cents in, but go ahead and finish up. Yeah, I'll just end it with um, sometimes the customer is so important that it is worth it just to fill out the questionnaire um, and not uh, be a thorn in the sales process. But John, over to you. Okay, yeah. Um, hello, everyone. I'm I'm John Bass. It's um, CISO, and I'm I, I'm sitting in listening to this. We're in a similar boat. We're a, a reasonably small managed services company. If you um, you know serving um, SMB and, and some large companies as well, um, we we're, we often get asked that we get all those questionnaires. We fill them out. A couple of things that we have done. Um, we have gone through a, um, a SOC two type two audit, um, and you know short of answering those. Um, questions, we we will submit that. We also have recently undergone an, um, a NIST um, 800-171 audit, and, and the results of that have been uploaded to, to, to NIST, along with going through the CMMC um, audit requirements. Now, we have some problems with being a small company. We don't have a sponsor. Uh, we um, Getting that final certification will be um, difficult until we have a specific um, um, client that will sponsor us, but at least we have an auditor's attestation that we um, have followed um, the NIST guidelines and the CMMC guidelines for defense contractors. It's just a small thing we do. Um, we have, you know, online privacy statements that we offer as, as well. So I, I'm, it's just specific things we've done to try to um, circumvent that 
similar question. And that's all I have. Okay, well, thank you, John, Brian, Dustin. Our next question, and John, you may have answered this, but maybe you can clarify. Question comes in from Wendell. How do the new SEC rules mesh with CMMC? Gosh, and you know, I don't exactly know um, the difference. One um, one is is filing requirements and disclosure, whereas another is what do you do if you work with the Department of Defense or if you're a defense contractor and wish to get defense contracts? So I don't exactly see that they're perfectly aligned. They seem to me, and Brian, I'd ask you to clarify, they seem like two separate things to me. They're separate with overlap, right? For example, um, you know, a lot of the CMMC controls, they're the NIST 800-171, uh, of course, with uh, some additional requirements beyond that. But look, I mean, with every type of new regulation, they each have their own little slant to it. But if you're doing things the right way and really covering your basis, you know, most likely you can handle any type of compliance requirement that they're going to throw at you. And maybe it varies slightly. Like, do we have, you know, 72 hours to report like GDPR or do we have um, four days you know, uh, with, in the case of the SEC? So, I, you know, I don't know. Is, is there that much difference in the, in the nuances for sure? But um, I think if you're doing things the right way, again, you have a risk management framework, which is important for both. Uh, you can follow NIST uh, risk management framework, for example, right? That's going to satisfy uh, both in these cases, right? You should have a list of controls that, you know, that you're evaluating and mapping those risks to. But that's going to apply to both. In some cases, right, your controls may be directly from, um, in this case, the CMMC, you know, as they're listed out. Um, or you may choose to tailor them, you know, more specifically to your organizations beyond uh, what's coming out of the box. So I'll, you know, simply... There's a lot of overlap, um, but again, there's nuances between each um, type of standard and regulation. Well, thanks, Brian. One thing I did want to mention, uh, you mentioned that the NIST framework will don't do what SolarWinds did or the CISO from SolarWinds do and say you're following the NIST framework and not be following the NIST framework. Otherwise, you'll get accused of or charged with fraud and, uh, and other charges as well. Yeah. And that's a really good point, Bill, and something to talk about is is getting getting through your audits and 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 doing um and, and saying you do things and actually doing it are they're problematic. Um, you know, it's it's a lot of work to to stay compliant, to get these certifications. And once you've got it, then people are like, oh, thank God that project's over. Now let me get back to my job. And all these policies and procedures um then then go into a form of neglect. And I think that's the point is you gotta figure out how to develop these techniques and then in policies and then actually use them and follow them. Okay. Well. That's a small company perspective of what happens. Might be a little different in larger organizations where people have specifically designated roles, but when you have shared roles in a smaller company, which often happens, it, it's a challenge. Brian, Dustin, any follow-up comments there? No. Okay. Good. John, Brian, Dustin, really appreciate it. And that does appear to be the end of our questions right now. A few uh, follow-up items here. Again, if you'd like to learn more about how GSI and Nitro can help address any of your cybersecurity needs, you can reach out via my contact info or complete the form that I did uh, send to you in the chat. Uh, Brian, Dustin, John, any closing comments? Don't lie to the regulators. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Brian. <laughs> Great point. Okay, well, uh, we will be following up with copies of the slides as well as a link to our recording. Uh, we'll also provide some uh, other helpful links as well. And thanks again, everyone, for attending our presentation and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.